Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. In this video, we're going to do some examples of finding area under curves, just calculating some definite integrals. We'll show you the graph and actually work these integrals for you. We've got six examples we're going to do. If you see one that's more interesting to you than the others, you can go ahead and skip to that. Otherwise, you're welcome to work along with us through each of these. For the first one here, we have the integral of 6x minus x squared on the interval 0 to 6. So you can see this function would be a parabola that opens down. So for this first one here, each of these will be a power rule to do the antiderivative. So here the power will go up by 1, so we'll get x squared. We'll divide by the new power, which would be divide by 2. We already have a multiple of 6 out here though, so constant multiple 6 divided by 2 actually gives us 3x squared. Minus, power goes up by 1 here for our power rule, so it becomes x cubed. Divide by the new power gives us over 3. We'll go ahead and plug in our bounds 0 and 6. We want to make sure we do it in the correct order. We always plug in our upper bound into this expression. Then we subtract what we get when we plug in the lower bound. So if we go ahead and plug in 6, that will be 3 times 6 squared minus 6 cubed divided by 3 minus 3 times 0 squared minus 0 cubed divide by 3. I think we can see here with the 0, everything's going to be 0, right? So let's focus over here. We'll have 3 times 6 squared, which would be 3 times 36, minus 6 cubed divided by 3. 6 cubed is 216, divided by 3. So if we do 3 times 36, that's 108, minus 216 divided by 3, that's 72, and we in fact get 36. If we were calculating this and answering as area, we would say 36 units squared. If we're just calculating this integral, we may just say 36. Looking at our second one, the integral from 0 to 4 of square root x dx. So I've drawn a square root function here. Let's go ahead and think of this root x as a power. Remember, we can think of the square root of something as that to the 1 half. So we'll think of this integral and use the power rule as x to the 1 half. If we take the antiderivative of x to the 1 half, remember we will add 1, so we'll get x to the 3 halves. We'll divide by the new power, divide by 3 halves as well. And we'll evaluate on the interval 0 to 4. Now divide by 3 halves, a fraction in a fraction is not so good. So I'm going to go ahead and bump that out and call it multiply by the reciprocal. So we're going to say 2 thirds x to the 3 halves and we'll evaluate that from 0 to 4. I could go ahead and bump my 2 thirds out if I want. Maybe I'll go ahead and do that. Let's say 2 thirds times, that would give me 4 to the 3 halves minus 0 to the 3 halves. Now we just want to be careful about our power 3 halves here. What does this mean? Well, this denominator of 2 means take the square root, right? So both of these say take the square root. And then the 3 on the top of the fraction says, then cube whatever you get. So we would actually have, let's do the square root part first. If I just do the square root part, this becomes 2, so we'd have 2 cubed. Minus, if I take the square root of 0, I would still have 0, right? So each of these become cubes. And then we can think of 2 thirds times 2 cubed, which is going to be 8. 0 cubed is going to be 0. So we end up with 2 thirds times 8, and that gives us 16 thirds. Looking here, we have the integral from 1 to e, the constant e, of the function 1 over x dx. So we have the function 1 over x. Remember, e is about 2.7-ish and some change, so we have the area underneath this from 1 to a little beyond 2.7. Remember that this looks like a power rule, but this is actually the derivative of a function that we know called the natural log. So when we take the antiderivative of 1 over x, we actually get the natural log of absolute value x, evaluated from x equals 1 to x equals e. Now I can look here and notice that e is a positive number and 1 is a positive number, and when I plug those in, I'm just going to get positive numbers. So evaluating these, I don't really need my absolute value at this point since I'm plugging in only positive stuff. So that will give us the ln of e minus ln of 1. Now these are actually numbers that we should know. What is ln of e? ln of e is actually 1. And what is natural log of 1? What is log of any base of 1? It's 0. So we get 1 minus 0. 
and this is actually 1. This tells us a neat thing about the graph of 1 over x. This tells us that the area between 1 and e, this is actually exactly 1 unit. Let's look at our next one here. We have the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the x dx. So I've got my representation. Here's exponential growth, e to the x. And there's x equals 0 and x equals 1. So this is really also calculating the area in here. Let's go ahead and do our easy antiderivative of e to the x. What is it? Of course we know, right? It's e to the x because the derivative of e to the x is itself. We'll evaluate from 0 to 1. Maybe this one's too easy for us. It could be. So if we plug in 1, we'll get e to the 1 minus. When we plug in the lower bound, we'll get e to the 0. What is e to the 1? Well, anything to the 1 is itself, right? So this is just e minus. What is e to the 0? Well, that'll be 1, right? And so e minus 1 is a good exact answer. If you wanted to get a decimal, you could go ahead and put e in a calculator and subtract 1 and say, well, it's about 1.71-ish. But let's move on to the next one. Our number 5 here, we have the integral of sine x dx from 0 to pi. So you can see this is basically under one hump of our sine function here between sine and the axis. If we go ahead and do our antiderivative of sine x, just be careful. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. The antiderivative is negative cosine x. So we'll take that antiderivative. We'll plug in 0 to pi there. Make sure you do it in the correct order. So plugging in pi first, we'll get negative cosine of pi minus, plugging in the lower bound, negative cosine of zero. Let's figure out what each of these are. Cosine of pi, that's on the left side of the unit circle. So cosine of pi itself is already negative one, but I have a negative in front of that, so that's actually positive one. And then here I have minus negative, I'll just call that plus. What is cosine of zero? Cosine of zero, zero is an angle on the right side of the unit circle, so its cosine value is one, right? So we get one plus one there, and that gives us two. So actually the area of one hump of the sine function here, we actually have two units of area there. And let's look at our last one here. We have this nice gently sloping function here, one over one plus x squared. We're gonna integrate that dx from zero to one. So you can see this region here represents this integral. What is the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared? We should know that. It's a definition, actually. It is the inverse tangent of x, right? So this inverse tangent of x has a derivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared. So the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is inverse tangent of x. Now we have to plug these in and do the subtract, right? So we'll have the inverse tangent of 1, and then we'll subtract the inverse tangent of zero. Now remember, inverse functions just ask you about the angle, right? So inverse tangent of one is saying what angle gives us a tangent value of one, and that would be where sine and cosine are the same value in quadrant one, and that is pi over four gives us a tangent value of one minus Inverse tangent of zero says what angle gives us a tangent value of zero? Well, think about tangent is sine over cosine, right? So maybe if we remember this, we can do this without having to type it into anything. Or maybe you just know, and that's fine. When is a fraction zero? Well, a fraction is zero when the top is zero, right? So we want to know what has a sine value of zero, right, based on this, and that's actually zero. So we get pi over four minus zero. Our answer for this last one is actually pi over four. All right, just some basic introductory functions here, nothing too complicated to integrate, but hopefully this gives you a good basic start on computing your definite integrals. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in the next video.